Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody. So today we are going to continue our building fintech and DeFi companies playbook. This is going to be the second entry in our podcast coverage of this topic. And if you want to read along or if you want to see the written version of this coverage, check out the newsletter Deep Dives into these topics at fintechblueprint.com or lex.substack.com, where we've got the full written out version of what I'm about to cover. So just to remind everybody, these are slightly different sessions than our usual sessions. You know, Normally we'd have conversations with people to try and understand how they approach their own building strategy, i.e. how they think about the blueprint for their companies. And in this session, what we're trying to do is lay down the groundwork for how to build our own blueprint sequentially for creating a company in the financial technology space. You know, whether it's a consumer company or a software or a technology or a capital focused business, the advice that I'm trying to share will be generalizable to the different things that you're doing. Okay. So in the very first session, what we did is we talked about looking at markets and figuring out the shape of demand. And then we talked about the types of business models that you can create, whether it's around money in motion, money at rest, money at risk, and the different ways that economics flow in those situations. Today, we'll talk about marketing And in particular, we'll try to open up some of the key ideas around a consumer fintech approach. So people talk about this as B2C, right? So business to consumer. Sometimes they'll call it retail. Sometimes people will talk about users. And in many ways, B2C fintechs, as well as B2C crypto exchanges and so on, those are the canonical type of company that people think about when we talk about fintech in general. It's not the only one. And if you've followed along for a while, you'll know how we talk about the manufacturing of financial products versus the distribution of financial products. But B2C fintechs are, I'd say, one of the brightest signals of the transformation of the distribution of financial products, meaning taking that from human distribution, people selling stuff, to digitally native, web-first distribution. And so neobanks, neobrokers, robo-advisors, insurtechs, payments wallets, all that stuff is B2C fintech and obviously has seen a lot of attention and building from Revolut to Robinhood to Chime to many others. So let's say you are thinking about creating a business in this space and you have a good idea of a market. And now what you've got to figure out is whether you're going to follow the B2C route or whether you're going to try and follow the B2B route, which is business to business. Now, there's also B2B2C, which is business to business to consumer. And sometimes people talk about the end client of the business for which you're providing infrastructure in your B2B approach. But this is a really important kind of distinction to set up front. Are you going to go and get end customers, end users, the people whose money you'll end of the day be touching or advising? Or are you trying to provide software and infrastructure for somebody else? And that decision, you know, sometimes is forced on you by the market environment. So you might come to become an entrepreneur because you understand the B2C problem. You understand that people need mortgages or need to refinance their student loans because you had a student loan. And that may be your entry into the problem set. But then depending on where the market cycle is, 
it's possible that you're too early and people aren't ready to buy or refinance mortgages on the web or in the phone or in your metaverse, NFT gallery, wherever it is that you're trying to sell it in the next platform shift. And so pivoting out of B2C into serving incumbents with new technology is often the path that, that companies go through. You know, So if you think about SigFig or my own journey with Nest Egg and Advisor Engine or you know, lots of crypto companies that started trying to reach consumers but then turn into infrastructure. You know, people talk about selling shovels in a gold rush instead of going after the gold. I think a lot of people would love to go and get the gold, but if it's a bear market or it's a difficult time or you're the fifth entrant and you can't win, often you'll see people go into providing infrastructure. Now, here we're not talking about providing infrastructure. Here we're talking about going direct to your customers. And so going direct in a B2C format means that you have to build out the correct go-to-market strategy, meaning you have to build the right elements of your organization to fit the places where your customers are, right? So for a neobank or another comparable type of startup, you need to have millions and millions of users who are in your product. If you want your company to be worth you know, a billion dollars or 10 billion or at some point $100 billion, right? maybe you want to be the size of Visa and, and be worth $500 billion, you're going to need hundreds of millions of users to get to that scale. But in B2C land, even getting to a million or five million users is, at least in my mind, is like a big benchmark for making it. Right, And if you look at a lot of the fintech SPACs that tried to go public and got crushed, but regardless, tried to go public, even to just be eligible to step up to that plate, you need to be able to say, I've got a million users. Right? If you say, I've got 50,000 really excited people, it's going to be tough. And that's why you see that it's tough for companies like Betterment, who are maybe pretty good at generating cash flow because they have large investors that are using them on average rather than a lot of small investors. But that story of we've got millions of people is very compelling and it's hard to reach it sometimes when you're selling big ticket items. This is one of these equations you actually have to tune is are you going from millions of people who are providing $10 of revenue per year you know, and you're kind of squeaking by as a neobank? Are you going for 100,000 people and each one is paying you 500 to to $1,000 per year? You know, what is your equation? And figuring out that equation up front is really important. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. And in thinking about those millions of people that you want in your app or in your service, you also have to not lie to yourself about what a user is. It's very tempting. So a user is not somebody who visits your website and doesn't sign up, right? That's just traffic. So you might need dozens of millions in traffic of attention up from conversion into a user. And then once somebody signs up for your product, are they using your product for free, right? So the mint.com model where this, or the personal capital model where you have a giant product that's free, data aggregation, analysis, and so on. And then once you've got those users, how many of them are actually paying? And you can monetize them in different ways. You can, if you are someone like Credit Karma, and hopefully I'm not mixing up my names, but if you're somebody like Credit Karma, you might pull in all of that attention into your free product and then sell off the leads without actually doing the financial manufacturing. Or alternately, you might really want to capture people into your proprietary asset management or deposits or whatever it is. And so you start building out a funnel within your product to convert people down, down, down. And so the, the real metrics around users have to be those where you actually hold people's assets, where those people actually pay you. you know, so watch out for things like MAUs, monthly active users, in products where the monthly active users don't pay the company. So you know, it's, it's very easy to tell incorrect stories depending on you know, how you define these things. Now, we talked about B2B before, and in those cases, you're not thinking about the same funnel because you might be making 10000 or 100000 in revenue out of your customers or several million in revenue out of your customers. And so the dynamics for how you organize your business are actually going to be quite different from the dynamics how you organize to succeed in a B2C marketing sort of conversion funnel, you know, from awareness to education to trials to actual pulling the money over. 
So I think I've anchored before giving you a sense of how much revenue there is per user. If you look at the neobanks, it really was like $20 per year, which isn't very much, which is why all of the consumer fintechs tried to add new products. And if you look at SoFi or if you look at Monzo and Starling and Square Cash App, if you look at PayPal even, right, you'll start to see as many adjacencies as possible getting built out meaning I'm an investment app, let me give you some cash servicing, and then let me give you crypto trading. Or alternately, I am a lending app, let me give you a cash-like account and an ETF investment, savings investment, sort of asset allocation type of account. And the reason for that, why everyone's adding things on, is they're trying to grow the value that they get per user. Now, we know how that played out, which is it didn't really work as well as we wanted to, but I'll touch on that in a little bit. I want to get to some more tactical discussion of marketing and marketing programs because that is the lever. Now, people might be calling it marketing or growth. You can rebrand it and call it whatever you want. But end of the day, it's a skill set of getting a lot of attention and getting a lot of people to persuade a lot of people at the margin to do something they might not want to do, right? Because generally speaking, financial products give people anxiety. And so you need to overcome that anxiety through storytelling and get them to pull the trigger and end up in your product. And somehow you get your hands on their assets and then start providing them value. So the very first place, there's a lot of disciplines in marketing, but the very first place where I think is important to start is brand. And Finance people, me being one of them, are not good at brand, are not good at creative output. And that can be lethal. Brand is really, really important, but it's not important necessarily in the way that people think, in that it's not about being clever and it's not about you know, something fake or confusing or something that's shilling a particular token or a company in a way that's not true. Brand is also not a logo. It's not a color scheme or a logo or a sticker that you put on your forehead. Rather, brand is something that captures the totality of the experience that people have with your firm. So yes, a logo and a name is an example of brand or is a symptom of brand. It's one of the expressions. But the promise that you make to your customers and their experience in your product is also in your brand. It also defines your brand, right? So if you have fantastic sort of visual imagery and really cool storytelling, looking at you, HSBC, but then it doesn't actually deliver, it doesn't ring true, then you fail your brand promise and the brand becomes this kind of sarcastic statement, right? So an example would be I brought up HSBC because they do a lot of banner advertising in airports about how international they are, that everywhere you go, you can access an HSBC account, which is true. There is HSBC all over the world. Now, the difficulty is that the local branches, for example, my personal experience, one in the United States and then one in the United Kingdom, they're not really connected. Like you can't have a US HSBC account that just sort of magically appears in the UK and is contiguous. So the brand promise of HSBC that in an airport where all these international people are who need really good international banking services, that converts you into going to that particular provider. But then the actual brand experience of like what you get is very discordant with the brand promise. And it's immensely difficult to deliver on the brand promise. But for example, somebody like Revolut or TransferWise, I think, delivers on a brand promise of international connectivity really, really well, even though they do much less. They do it simpler and they deliver on the idea of global connectivity. So we can see that you know, TransferWise or Wise has been rewarded in its stock price for being able to do what it is that they say that they do. So brand's not just the sticker, it's not the logo, it's not the typeface, and it's not just the product experience, it's also how you recruit your employees and what experience your employees have in your company. You know, Are you expressing your brand values? If you're saying that you are customer-centric and empathetic, as a business, right? If you are modern and 
digital, but then in your recruiting practices, you're extremely paper focused and very traditional and evaluate people just on their university degrees. You're not being consistent with the brand promise. And so this is the difficult thing about brand is that it's the total experience, the total promise you make to all of the stakeholders across your company. And so, you know, vision and mission, all these things plug into the brand, they're elements of it. Now, as I said, it's really tough for finance professionals to get creative and get into that mindset where they can think about the types of attributes their company should represent and and the way that the company would represent those attributes to all of the various stakeholders. And so the things that I would just, you know, from a very practical point of view, here's what I would focus on. Number one, color. Color has emotion. If you don't know what emotion color has, just Google color, emotion, and go to Google Images, right? Red is going to be closer to danger and excitement. Green is going to be closer to peace. And blue is going to be closer to kind of trust and strength and defensibility. And that's why every single finance company is blue. That's why every single new and innovative thing is going to be pink or purple. Colors have a consistent meaning, and you should use that. So that's number one. Number two is the naming of companies. Everybody wants to be clever. You know, so how can you be Nike or Apple, right? How can you have this like standout brand that captures attention, that has a vibe to it? And, you know, the vibe of a brand we know is literally valuable, right? Billions of dollars for the Coca-Cola brand, the McDonald's brand. If you were to acquire a name like that, Without any assets, it would still be worth billions of dollars. So everyone wants to be clever, but it's a high-end game. You can't just you can't just back into it. And so there's so many nonsense startup names that are just plain embarrassing. And so what I would advise, instead of trying to play a brand game where you're trying to be clever, just be as straightforward and as plain as possible. Forget being clever and just name your thing as what it is so that it's really simple to understand. You probably don't have the creative juice to make it super special. You know, so I'm not picking on these following examples. I'm just giving you examples of things that sound like what they are, which is a good enough answer for most of us. So Future Advisor, this was an early digital investing company. Future Advisor, guess what it does? It's a financial advisor, but using future technology. Or Lending Club, We know Lending Club, and we know what it does. It's on the one side, you've got a club of people who put money together, and on the other side, they lend it out. Coinbase. It's a base for all your coins. These are not groundbreaking names. You know, Facebook, Microsoft, these are not amazing names. They're not beautiful, they're not clever, they're just, here's what it is. You know, Foot Locker, Coffee Shop, Laundromat. Like, they just tell you what the thing is. You're not going to get an A-plus for it, but you're going to capture attention. It helps your Google search engine results. Just pick a name that describes what you do. So that's approach number one. You know, approach number two, the hard approach, the being clever approach, is much more difficult, and you might need to get an agency or somebody who's very creative and has done this a lot and tries to design words and images that connect and stand out and have a much more guttural emotional story to them. You know, so I say you'll always have time to do that. You will be able to get there. You don't need to start that way. You know, otherwise you end up with stuff like, you know, Monzo or N26, even companies that use like a Money Lion or Dave, you end up with weird outcomes, right? I would say start playing and then after you understand what you're actually delivering to your customers reverse into a brand that reflects their experience. Most of you probably don't want to hear me talk about brand and positioning so much, but you can't get there without sort of congealing yourself into something. Your vision for the future and your mission to achieve that all flow out of the promise you make to the world with your positioning. So it's really important to nail that down. Okay, so the next tactical step Once you 
you know, you've got your demand that you're focused on, you've named yourself, you've instantiated yourself into the world. Arguably, you've created some differentiation in terms of how you do it, who you go after. You know, you don't look like others, or if you do, you at least fit in in terms of how you look. And the next step is to figure out how you're actually going to acquire customers and how are you going to build awareness of who you are. We are still coming off of the Web 2 era. You know, we're entering the Web 3 era, which is token and ownership based, but we're still coming off of the Web 2 era. And that's where most of the work lies. And the Web 2 era is defined by attention. It's defined by free things that we receive in exchange for giving our attention to receive those free technology products. You know, if you want to be dark about it, we give away our attention and plug it into large artificial intelligence algorithms in order to be entertained. And by doing so, we, you know, we consume at scale lots of commercial products from people who advertise to us. So advertising and figuring out where your clients are are really important. Now, not everybody can go out and start spending money on growth. So you have to first start, especially as a young company, you have to first start with organic growth. Now, you don't want to just be in the street yelling through a megaphone about your existence, but in some ways, that's how you're going to feel. If you don't have the megaphone and if you're not telling people that you exist, your stealth company that's super secret doesn't exist and no one cares. Maybe you are the former founder of Braintree or Oculus or whatever, and so you've got a ton of personal leverage and financial leverage that you can bring to the table, and you can afford to build quietly and in secret. Most of us, the vast majority of entrepreneurs, cannot afford to be in stealth and be quiet and keep it secret. And of course, I'm talking about fintech and DeFi. I'm not talking about biotech or hardware innovation or things that are patent protected and meaningful in that way. Rather, I'm talking about people building businesses that are trying to get at large pools of financial services demand in slightly novel ways. And you need to get that first initial audience of people who love your product and are willing to be your champions. And so if you don't have lots of cash, your pre-seed or maybe your early seed stage, you need to get attention in organic ways. And so you've got to do things like content, newsletters, influencers, and social media. And depending on the type of product you're doing, you have to figure out PR and press relations and your interactions with traditional media. I mean, all of this stuff is kind of content. And then sometimes physical events and leaning into sales. Although, again, for the type of company here, you're probably not doing a ton of conferences and events. Okay, so the content you're building is going to be organic, meaning you're not paying to promote it. But it also has to map against a buying journey. And a buying journey, again, starts from your user, your customer. So you're not doing content for yourself. It's not that like you're so excited to write that blog post about how you developed that feature. Nobody cares, doesn't matter, totally irrelevant, please don't post it. Rather, what you're trying to do is figure out where does your ideal customer live, how do they make a purchasing decision, and where is their intent? at different stages of the process. If I want to open a new bank account for my small business, how do I start thinking about that? What article could I be reading? What could I be searching, right? What's my search intent? And then number two is, as I do my comparison shopping, what articles am I being linked to? What do I consider to be authentic and true? What do I consider to be shilling and misleading? And then how do I make the purchase? How do I actually pull the trigger? And then if I navigate away from making a purchase, how do you retarget me? How do you follow me back across different social media properties and remind me that I actually do want to open this small business bank account and so on, right? And, and then how do you retain me? But content isn't about you, it's about your customer. And there's still really powerful levers you can pull on this. It's a lot of work, and the payoff is, is quite slow, but it's inevitable that you have to invest in some version of that, right? Mint.com is the best example 
of generating value through content marketing. You know, in 2007, they sold for 170 million. Today, that would be equivalent to somebody selling for you know 20 billion. It was a shocker. It was a big deal, and. They had over a million users for a personal finance management system, again, in 2007. If today somebody had 50 million users for personal finance management, it's just um, very, very strong performance. And the way they got there is through content marketing. And the, the content marketing they did was to figure out all of the search that their potential customers were doing and then to write articles against it and create lead magnets, which is basically a prompt to sign up for updates by putting your email here if you want to know when we launch the solution to your problem. You know, and I remember it's been so long, but one of the most silliest but most impressive things that stuck with me to this day, because I was trying to build the same thing for my robo-advisor when I was building it, is that they figured out their target profile, people who needed PFMs, were people who were not saving a lot of money. They were struggling with their budgets, right? So that's different from people who want to invest or who people who want to gamble on crypto. People who are trying to just budget and make it through and didn't have a lot of savings at all. So low quality credit type audience. And one of the articles that they published was cat food. Should I make my own cat food from leftovers of my own food or should I buy cat food at the store? You know, and it's funny. It's also really sad. It says a lot about people's savings. But the fact that that article exists and is written, I mean, it's a testament to a really weird and important process, which is actually figuring out the day to day concern of your customers and creating content and pages and conversations that people would land on and then would see you as one of them and as an advocate for their financial position. If I was struggling to feed my cat because I couldn't afford cat food, that's an article I would end up on. And then there was a software robot that could help me get out of this mess. You know, it's very compelling. You know, I, I think that doing this in 2007 was extremely powerful because nobody else was doing it. Now today, Lots of people are doing content. And so you're competing with massive content farms and robots and other software that's meant to downrank content farms. And instead of playing that particular version of the game, you have to play the version that is much more focused on social media. Again, where are your customers? How do they make decisions? So the attention pits of Twitter, if you're in crypto, of B2B, SaaS, embedded finance, insure tech, digital assets, blockchain on LinkedIn or on TikTok if you are doing personal finance, trading, that kind of stuff. You need to figure out how to get that content built and delivered to your target customer for free. And it costs you nothing. Of course, YouTube. YouTube's another one, right? It costs you nothing other than the cost of your time and the creation of the content. While doing it, you will figure so much about where the people you want to sell to are and then how they make decisions. So, you know, strong recommendation of if you're going to do organic content, do it using video, do it on social media, and kind of go long tail. So that's number one. Number two is you can also pay for this, right? You don't have to go organic. You can have this content generated for you. Or you can pay others who are already sitting on top of these attention audiences, right? So influencers, fintech, YouTube personalities, or just the advertising networks within these platforms are very good at aligning advertising against particular topics more so than ever before, right? So you, you can pay for leads and you might get them into your website for somewhere between 2 to $20 per. Now again, that's the cost of a lead to your website. What's the cost of converting them into your free product? What's the cost of converting them into your paid product? Probably much, much higher, right? Hundreds of hundreds of dollars, unless you figure out a growth hack. And a lot of payments apps did figure out a growth hack. You want that funnel to be as short as possible. But anyway, you can pay for attention. And that's also where some of the mistakes come from, right? So we know that SoftBank right now is in a lot of trouble. It had spent something like $80 billion uh, funding lots of B2C fintech companies and has since lost $10 billion 
every other quarter and erased all of the gains, all of the paper gains that they had. And the real gains from things like Alibaba and Ant Financial got all spent on the WeWorks of the world, creating real capital losses and real economic damage. And SoftBank was one of the main drivers of a strategy called blitz scaling. Blitz scaling is when you try to corner a market as fast as possible once you convince yourself that the unit economics work. And this is the danger because convincing yourself that the unit economics work is not the same thing as the unit economics working. So very often what happens with these very highly valued or used to be very highly valued fintechs, 10 times to 50 times revenue, was that the valuations were simply wrong. They were just a way of shoving marketing dollars into these companies that could then be spent on advertising to acquire vanity customers who did not convert into revenue. And then the vanity customers were used to drive further valuation markups and further cash investment into the companies to acquire more users. And so blitz scaling is very advantageous for the advertising platforms because essentially you're shoving money directly into market share battles without validating that the actual markets are worth sharing, that the companies there can be sustainable. So blitz scaling tries to accelerate past that organic grind of validation that I talked about. It tries to really lean into paid acquisition much, much faster. And of course, you can have a disaster. That's the point of the risk capital to have a disaster, but I don't know, life's too short to, to be putting money into the trash bin. And so the equation that you've got to figure out this is just basic unit economics. This isn't going to be anything groundbreaking, but you have to figure out the balance between the cost of customer acquisition and the lifetime value of the customer. And I started talking about these numbers a little bit earlier, so they're going to sound familiar, but I'll do it again because it's important. So what is the cost of your customer acquisition? The cost to acquire a click from a search engine might be $2 or $10 or $20, right? And that click, it might end up into a website that generates no revenue. It might just end up on a page that says, read this article. Not very good money spent. Or it might lead to a conversion page into a free product. You know, sign up for this portfolio tracker or sign up for, to get your credit score. And that person, you know, you pay 10 bucks to acquire that person now only one out of three or one out of four people is going to do your free trial, right? So you go from paying 10 per click or five per click to times four. So you're at 20 or 50 bucks just to get that person into your software. And then once they're on your software, they're probably, you're losing money on them because you're paying hosting costs to service them. You know, they're not just an entry in your database. They're doing something that might cost you money. So that's kind of step two. And then step three is, of the people who signed up, how do you get them to move money over and actually start doing something for you where you're generating revenue? And so you can suddenly see how the cost of customer acquisition might go from what looks like 10 to actually what looks like 50 to actually what looks like 500. You know, and if you look at industry numbers in traditional lenders or traditional checking accounts, a digital lender might pay $300 to acquire a customer. A credit card might pay $200. Checking account can be anywhere from $500 to $2,000. Brokerage account from $300 to $1,000. You know, these are chunky numbers. But traditional financial institutions can pay them because on the other side of the equation, they are often the primary banking relationship. And that means that they're going to get all of your money, thousands and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in some cases, and generate thousands of dollars of revenue per person. The reminder here is that the neobanks generated $20 per year per person. That's not very much. That's why as a B2C player, you have a choice here. If you're really good at figuring out demand, maybe what you do is you just sell it off. If you build a really good machine where you can pull in a million 10 million, 50 million in traffic and capture them in some sort of user experience, you can just sell off the leads for 50 bucks a pop to credit card providers, 
other banks, whatever it is, because you will have done that first step of the conversion. And I don't remember the name, but I know in the insurance space, there have been kind of really good consumer portals that were able to aggregate lots of demand and then sell to big carriers, for example, as a digital servicing or aggregating platform. So there are ways to arbitrage and make a pretty nice business, $500 million business, something like that, out of just getting your leads and selling them through. If you want to look at a public company that does this, take a look at LendingTree, which was a very early lead generation company that that was at least used to be successful. I don't know how they're doing now. Alternately, you can try to pull it all the way through into your proprietary product, but you know, you can do things to be clever. Like you can take this funnel and make it much shorter. So PayPal offering whatever it was, 10 or 20 bucks in the 90s for people to sign up for a PayPal account, that's a lot better than paying $500 on ads and and hope that people convert, right? That's a great deal. You can build referral programs with similar economics as long as you know what your number is. And so you need to know what your other side of the equation looks like, which is customer lifetime value. Customer lifetime value is you think about the revenue that someone generates per year. You take out cost. So let's say you have a margin of 80%, right? So $10 in revenue, $8 per year. And then someone's going to stay on average with you three years. So that's about $25 from a customer. You shouldn't be acquiring customers for more than 25 bucks, right? And so this is also, again, where the fintech specs hit the, hit the wall because they all told the story about how today customer lifetime value is 25 or 50 or 100, but then enterprise value of the whole company is worth 1,500 or 1,000. That's how the valuations would work. And the explanation for this would be, we'll introduce so many products and expand out that the enterprise value will be 10 times as much or appropriately should be 10 times as much as it is today. You know, and so let's say your payments wallet, your cash app, you're adding now credit and savings and insurance and investments. And you know, there's a great ARC innovation slide about it where the value per customer for a traditional bank could be something like $20,000 over the lifetime. And of course, that gets exciting. You know, if enterprise value today is 1,000 per customer, 20,000, that's a lot of growth. Unfortunately, that thesis is yet to, to play out. Cross-sell is really, really difficult. So especially in a market like now, there's a lot of contraction. Doing your core thing, doing it really well, and doing it with unit economics that work is non-negotiable. That's what you've got to figure it out. So again, cost of customer acquisition on the one side, don't get lost in blitz scaling or get confused about what it is that you're buying. And then on the other side, the lifetime value of the customer. Don't get confused about your future growth. Kind of be specific and anchor yourself in realistic things. So hopefully this has been a helpful view around B2C marketing and acquisition. We can talk about a lot of other different things and kind of the details around the different marketing programs And hopefully you have curiosity after this episode to go and look for that yourself. What we wanted to do is point out the main levers, right? The main lever, the first one is just what does a B2C business look like versus a B2B one that is driven by marketing, that is driven by unit economics, and that you have to think about structuring your company against the shape of your customer and their purchasing experience. Now, the second point is around branding and how that's so much bigger than a logo and a color. It's the total experience that your company has to your stakeholders and the brand promise through your mission and your vision and everything that you do on everyone around you. And I talked about building a functional brand rather than kind of a really fancy brand. You can back solve into a fancy brand once you actually know what it is that you're doing. And then finally, we talked about marketing programs and how to go organic, how important content is and sharing your story, and then how to go the paid way and acquire that attention and what to watch out for. And in particular, that equation of customer acquisition versus lifetime value. Thank you so much for tuning in into our Build It series focused on building fintech and DeFi companies. And we will see you next time. 
Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.